So everybody, this is Heather Blankenship. I am super excited to have her here because I get this question all the time. What about RVs? And what better way to answer that question and all the ancillary questions that come along with that than to bring in the RV expert. Heather, for those who don't know you, give us a quick background. Sure. Uh, I bought my first RV park almost 11 years ago. Um, and have just continued to leverage that property and buy more RV parks, mobile home parks, and some Section 8 multifamily. Uh, I also run a mastermind group uh, for people interested in RV parks and I'm active on social media with all that information also. How many are you up to now? Uh, I have four RV parks and four mobile home parks at this point. And you're all in the Knoxville, Tennessee area, or you have some in Florida too, yeah? Uh, I'm all in Tennessee, uh, not necessarily Knoxville, but I live in South Florida. That's right. That's right. Every time I try to head out there, you're always in Florida. I'm like, what? All your <laughs> stuff is out here. What are you doing? But then again, I'm the same way. I own stuff all over the place. So what, 11 years ago, I didn't know it was that long ago. Yeah. What, how did the lead hit and what grabbed your attention about it? So uh, I was driving across the country from Florida to California in a camper, and I was just looking around. I didn't know anything about real estate. I didn't even realize RV parks were real estate at that point. And I'm like, this is just renting parking spots. It's got to be easy. Uh, it is not renting parking spots. Um, <laughs> so I started Google searching RV parks for sale, and, and I did live in Knoxville, Tennessee at the time, and I'm looking for, um, there's a tourist town nearby, and I'm like, okay, there's got to be something here. And I, I found this thing on the internet. I don't even know where it was at this point. And I called the bank and they had one that was uh, in bankruptcy. I was 26 and the bank gave me a loan for non-recourse with no money down, which you cannot get now. Um, well, I mean, maybe somewhere, but not usually. Uh, for $3.2 million. And I had never seen bills like that. And I had to learn how to run an RV park. Did you take it down on your own? Did you syndicate? How did you? No. Um, so I have about $30 million in real estate right now with no partners. That's, oh my gosh, incredible. So at 26 years old, you had the liquid cash for the down payment and- They didn't make me have a down payment. They gave it to me with no money down and non-recourse. Unbelievable. It, it was after the crash and you know the banks, anything they still had on, and it was a local bank. So they were trying to figure out how to operate it themselves. And so they were just assuming anything was better than the nothing they were getting and took the risk. Unbelievable. So at 26 years old, did you think you wanted to get into real estate or was this just <laughs> all happen, happenstance? I might be mildly impulsive. <laughs> uh, but again, I, I've stayed for 11 years. So uh, it worked out really well for them and well for me. Building that relationship with that bank has been, you know, a huge part of my success. So, so first and foremost, I did not know that about your background. And that is Absolutely incredible to yeah. hear. The way I want to kind of take this interview is to talk about how you operate, how you acquire them. And, but before we go down that route, I, I really want to ask, like when you were starting out, because a lot of folks that I talk to, they're working a corporate job and they're trying to escape it and a, a zero down $3.2 million deal. Like obviously that just does not exist nowadays. No. But when when you were 26 and, and in your camper, did you feel stuck in the corporate rat race or did you, were what were you doing at the time? Yeah. So I was a finance manager for Enterprise. I started working for them out of college and I actually liked that job. Uh, I did really great. And I hadn't thought of it as being, I didn't, you know, when we're in this space now, you hear all the terminology and the people talking about leaving their W-2 jobs and all these different things. I was still so young and out of college that I didn't think of it as that. I liked my job. I'd gone to college to, to do something like that. Um, but I was married at the time and my ex-husband was driving around the country for his job. So I was traveling with him and I was bored. I tried sewing. I tried knitting. I ran marathons. I just needed something to do. And so I was like, I'm going to buy an RV park. 
that's incredible incredibly lucky to have have bumped into that opportunity so then let's let's go down that path so you're 26 you got a an in default basically mobile home park uh sorry rv park yep nothing down it's heavy value add what happened how did you for the what happened in the first 90 days what were those lessons that you learned that just carried with you for the rest of your real estate career that you learned pretty much right out of the gate the hard way yeah so first of all there's it's closing day and let's say closings at two o'clock uh and the electric company calls and they say, if you don't bring us a $20,000 deposit, we're going to turn the electricity off right now. And you're like, wait, I haven't even closed yet. How can I give you $20,000? Like, what if something happens between now and then and everyone's going to lose their power? And it's like this major freak out moment because I hadn't even thought of needing a $20,000 deposit for the electric bill. Um, luckily I had this goal when I first graduated that I was going to retire at the same time as my parents. I didn't know how I was going to get there, but I was putting money into an account to try and try and do that. So I was able to pull and it wasn't a whole lot of money. It was, you know, I don't know, maybe $50,000. So I was able to pull some of that money for things like that $20,000 I needed for that. And also the bank gave me uh, interest only for six months. So I had a little bit of time to figure out how to keep operating so uh obvious calamity there day one you close you you find a way to bridge the gap with the the little cash that you do have what do you learn in the first 30 days of collecting money and i'm sure there was some knuckleheads that were living there and yeah what types of what types of lessons did you learn immediately as a 26 year old never expecting to see so there were a hundred sites at the time there, and it was running more like a mobile home park. A hundred people lived there. They had refrigerators outside and mailboxes and tarps everywhere. It, it was terrible. They were paying $300 a month and that included all of their utilities. So learning to manipulate things in a way that you can't be sued for, I think was that first 30 days, you know, finding city ordinances like refrigerators can't be outside so that they have to remove them immediately or that uh, you can't have those tarps outside within those city limits. Finding those legal ways to do things was some of the first lessons that I had to learn to make things happen quickly. So in other words, out of the gate, you had some knucklehead residents that you basically had to crack the whip. Absolutely. Yeah. I had to get rid of lots of people pretty quick. And, and in places like that, when you go in and start enforcing rules, like you got to clean up your sites and you can't have all this stuff out here, people start leaving because in an RV park, different than a mobile home park, they can just hook up their truck and they're gone in the morning and you didn't even know they were leaving. Right. Um, which, you know, we can talk about the pros and cons of that, but when you're trying to turn a property around, it's a much quicker process with an RV park than a mobile home park because of things like that. Yes, and that's exactly where we're going to end up going because, again, the question that I get all the time is, gosh, I cannot find a mobile home park, but there are these random RV parks that seem to be at really good cap rates. Should I just do that? And I think the answer that I want to have my audience here because I have a sprinkle of RV in my portfolios is just how different it really is for a lot of reasons. But before we kind of tap on that, so first and foremost, that's excellent news that for anyone listening in buying a heavy value add RV park, yeah, you quite literally can, they'll just turn it on and drive away versus I am literally, as of this recording, dealing with someone who hasn't cleaned up their trash in months and we finally non-renewed their lease. He owns his own home and he had his lawyer reach out which turned out to be someone impersonating a paralegal for a company. And we like softly called out this person. Hey, just FYI, if you're impersonating a legal representative, that may not necessarily be a great idea. Yeah. And then, and then that turned into, well, all right, I'll tell him to clean up his yard. And I'm like, that's what this is all about. Right. Because he can't just turn on his mobile home and drive away, especially right. if they're older mobile homes, even if they have the tongue, Yep. Some counties won't even allow you to move homes past a certain year, even if everything is perfect about the home. Yep. Whereas an RV, you turn the thing on or you just get a truck and you hook it up and you drive it away. So what I'm hearing, Heather, is you had a lot of knuckleheaddom out of the gate. But to me, 
that would my my next question, my follow up question to that would be, how are you going to replace those folks? What struggles did you realize out of the gate were really difficult about replacing those knuckleheads that left? Actually, replacing them was easy. There's hmm. such a demand in the RV industry, whether it's for a, you know, in, in RV parks, we have kind of short term parks and long term parks. We can talk about that later if you want. There's essentially like four different types of RV parks, but even in the long-term parks, you know, you hop on Craigslist or Facebook marketplace and you've got people within a couple of days who need somewhere to live and you can fill those sites. You, you probably know that from your, mm -hmm. your parks that have a mix. And then with the short-term parks, again, it's, it's such a demand where your average stay is about three days. Um, if you have a great software and you properly market it with your website and Google pay for clicks and AdWords and things like that, it's quick and easy and not, not a big deal. So it's more heavy into the marketing and I'm assuming a lot more intense. Do you feel like you have to pay for pay up for a more well-rounded property manager? Depends on the property. Some of them, again, function just like a mobile home park and you don't need to in those short term parks, depending on the size of them, potentially. Um, it really just depends on what you're asking that manager to do. The operations are a little heavier, but you're still looking at like 45 to 55% operating expenses if you're running properly. So it's not as extreme as you might think. So you're thinking your expense ratios are somewhere between 45 and 55. Now, is that general across the board or does it, does it, does it, you know, a mobile home park, once you hit a hundred, you're, you should easily be hitting 30 and below depending on your utilities, but you could have direct build everything and be a really small mobile home park and still hit it about 30. Uh, if not, you know, I have a bigger park that operates at 40, 45. Uh, is, is, do you start hitting a serious economy of scale or do you feel like most units, because they, in theory, I guess, are getting their own water and sewer build to that unit as well as the electrical. And if you're the park paying for that, then there are certain things that don't really hit that economy of scale in, in when you hit scale, or do you find that that's a good rule of thumb regardless? pretty much a good rule of thumb regardless depending on the type of park you have like we talked about there's some of them that are going to operate closer to that you might even get closer to that 30 percent if they're only long-term tenants and they have some of those things direct build it's it's very standard to have electricity direct build for people who are there more than a couple days not all parks do the sewer and the water and all of that they're starting to but it hasn't been something that the tenants or the customers are used to doing. So as hmm. they're, as the properties are shifting towards that, they're inching closer to that 30%, which are more like the 40% in those long-term parks. Interesting. I've noticed in my RV splash that they're a lot more price sensitive. It's, there's a lot less of the price inelasticity. Do you find that um, RV parks for the most part are pretty much at true market? Or do you feel like there's a lot of mom and pops, if you will, that are just dramatically below what true mean, market would support? Do you mean the rate or do you mean that the price they're selling for? No, I mean at the the RV lot rent. Oh, they're, they're so all over the place. So RV parks are 88% owned by mom and pops. So they're a lot less institutionalized than what the mobile home parks are. So you're going to find a ton of them that I, I just looked at a property that is in a tourist town and they're charging $25 a night in the rate, the going market's like $80. You're like, what on earth are y'all doing? This is a huge value add. So there is a ton of mom and pop deals out there that it's simply just switching operations to add a lot of money to that property. So I think the the relevant next question before we get into the pros and cons is let's talk about underwriting because like what I tell people is when you really, really get into RV, eventually you're getting into the hospitality business and you're yeah. exiting the housing business. What that would kind of the path that would lead me down in terms of underwriting is you could potentially underwrite the same property multiple different ways and get multiple different answers. Can you walk me through how you underwrite in general? What are, what are kind of just like a quick checklist that you look through? Like, is this more of a touristy spot? Is this more long-term, short-term? What's kind of your mental checklist when you, when you get a, a lead that hits your inbox and you're going to underwrite it? 
Yeah. So you'd be surprised by how similar it is to underwriting a mobile home park. The cap rates are obviously different, um, but the things you're, the metrics that you're looking at are very similar. And it's, it's definitely not as much of a science as when you're underwriting a mobile home park, it's more of an art because there's more variables. For example, if we, if we keep going down the theme of that first property that I bought, I still have that one. And it has more than 10 streams of income right now. I make a killing in laundry money. I make a ton of money running golf carts. The camp store alone brings in about $200,000 a year. And that's a really small camp store. So you have all these different streams of revenue that you're bringing in. And so trying to get an actual profit and loss statement that's, that's well-written from a mom and pop shop is tough. So one of the first things that you're trying to do is ask all the proper questions to kind of put your own profit and loss statement together. Now, obviously, if you get some information from a broker, you're going to have all of those details. Usually a good broker's put all that together for you, um, which is one of the nice things about having those packages, those OMs from them. But if you're doing off-market deals, which is where most of the money's at, you're trying to put that profit and loss statement together yourself because you're really operating a business. It's not just the real estate aspect that you have with a mobile home park but you're going back to, okay, what are my utilities? Because that can be make it or break it. Same rules apply to mobile home parks as they do RV parks as you're going through what kind of sewer they have. And then you're also looking at um, making sure that they have proper zoning and permitting, no different than a mobile home park. So it's, it's very similar in some of those, those high level checklists, but then getting in the weeds on that profit and loss statement is much different than what's your rent roll and here's your five expenses. Okay, my taxes might go up a little bit. I'm ready to make an offer. There's a lot more to go through in that profit and loss statement. My strategy professor, when I got my MBA, looked at my idea for mobile home parks way back in the day. And his advice probably will always stick with me. He said, mobile home parks are a mature industry. So it's not growth, it's not in decline, it's, it's just mature. And anytime you enter a mature space, you always want to find alternative revenue streams. And I've been looking for years to try and find good revenue streams. We've tried the laundry, which ended up being kind of a disaster because sketchy (laughs) characters always hung out there. So then you got to buy the cameras and then the police show up every now and then to get a copy of the camera footage. And it's like... Oh my gosh. And, and it gets to the point where you're like, and then you have to like create these little tag things or a code for people to use to get in. And then they, yep. they do that or they lose their key, their code key fobs. So you switch to the code and then you have to switch the code every week. And then somehow the word gets out and then there's sketchy people doing all sorts of illicit things <laughs> in there. And you don't want to watch the recording when the police show up. Rabbit hole that's oh never my gosh. Ending. Yeah. So to me, I've really struggled with that with, with MH, but what I've seen in the RV space and, and tell me what your experience is, the clientele tends to be a little bit more upscale so they can afford a little bit more. Because one big issue that we have in the MH space is if I open up a convenience store, a lot of these folks, they barely have enough money for food, medicine, and and rent. So why would they want to come buy things out of your convenience store when they're already to a certain degree struggling? Whereas an RV person who rolls in with a hundred thousand dollar rig is like, Oh, look, a vending machine. So tell me your experience with having multiple different revenue streams. And also have you found a way to take an idea from RVs and and implement it in a mobile home parks? Yeah. It's interesting. You word it that way because it's definitely not affordable housing. But Mm -hmm. you'll see a wide range of RV parks. And some of them are people who are traveling on a budget and they're not going to spend as much money in your property. But some of the more upscale RV parks, and then they don't have to be the giant ones with water parks and that, you know, are an actual luxury resort. Um, But the whole trend of camping isn't necessarily because people want an affordable vacation. It's a unique experience that they're looking to have. And that's one of the reasons that I love RV parks so much because you, the sky's the limit on those additional revenue sources. A couple of years ago, I added a pizza kitchen and that pizza kitchen just kills it in the amount of money that it, it pumps out, you know, and like you said, in an, a mobile home park, people don't necessarily have the money to do that. So The only thing that I've been able to transfer over to my mobile home parks is the laundry room. And we Mm. have similar issues to what you were talking about, even this recently as this week, trying to find video footage from one of them, somebody broke in, blah, 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 you know, 
story in my life with my mobile home parks, but <laughs> that doesn't seem to happen. On oh my RV gosh. Side. We had, we had this one couple, like literally just go in there at 2 AM, get buck naked and start doing the dirty. And, you know, obviously then you have your obvious, like dude goes in there, starts shooting up or tries to break in and take all the quarters. And it's like, bro, there's a big sign that says there's a camera right there. Yeah, like, exactly. Unbelievable. But that is really cool. So in other words, for, I, I think where if for the listeners, what you're starting to see here is, is we could go down so many different rabbit holes in terms of RVs. So I think the bigger lesson here is if you're someone who's going, wow, I really can't find mobile home parks for prices that I want to buy. I'll just do RV. I think if you're gathering this from Heather, it isn't that simple. And in a lot of ways, you're going into the hospitality business and you're also going into the business business. In other words, if you have a restaurant or convenience store or laundry, tell us if, if you end up having like 10 different revenue streams and you go to sell, are you looking to create a value based off EBITDA or based off a cap rate? Because it would a peach the kitchen even add to your, your cap rate if you were going the real estate route? So it depends on who you're selling to. There's different buyers who will pull out all of those ancillary incomes and your cap rate is applied to, you know, the income you're bringing in from your sites only. There's mm. some people who will pull it out and say, okay, because in RV parks, glamping is a huge thing. So um, it's a huge part of your industry. I have one of the properties has 21 cabins and it's the same as like a tiny home, which we can go down that road if you wanted to, but those 21 bring in like half a million dollars a year. And so they're on an RV site and you're renting out those cabins or tiny homes and bringing in a ton of extra income. So some people are going to underwrite that differently than they will your site. But as these institutional buyers are creeping into the space, it's getting a little more competitive. And so the more competitive it gets, the more you negotiate and things like the cabins or the glamping tents and things like that are starting to get underwritten on a cap rate, but not necessarily in the same way that your sites are. So <laughs> like you said, it's a little more of an, we said it's a little more of an art as you learn to pull out those different things. And some of them are being evaluated with multiples and some of them are being evaluated with a cap rate. So for those who are probably screaming, waiting for this, can they find 10 caps in RVs or where is, what's the range for RVs? Yeah, you could, you could definitely find a 10 cap, but it's not going to be what I just described to you. You're going to have to go in and you're going to have to do the work to get the property to where it should, what the ideal situation for that would be is you're finding this 10, 11, 12 cap of a mom and pop who have had a long-term park where people live there, but it's in an area that it should have been a short-term park huh. and they didn't want to do the work or they were just, you know, happy with the system they had going on. And you're going to convert that to a short-term park and quickly with some operational changes, maybe a small amount of CapEx and, you know, you got a great deal. So yes, but it's probably going to be a lot more work. Talk to us about lending. Are there a lot of seller yeah. carry deals? How do banks look at it? Do you got to sign recourse? So similar to what you're used to in the mobile home park space, you will find some owner financing. Um, not a ton, but it's definitely out there because these are properties that just like mobile home parks, they've been owned for generations and a lot of them don't have any debt. So if you're finding those, you might get some seller financing options, but I've had the best luck with local banks and credit unions. I think we've talked about this before. Um, they are so much better to you than the national lenders because sometimes you'll find a national lender that's willing to do it, but they'll say, okay, we want 50%. Like who's going to do 50%? Like so those national or local banks and credit unions seem to be doing about 80%, which is awesome. I love it. I literally have a deal I'm, I'm about to be under contract with. I got the e-sign docs waiting for me in, the, in my inbox right now. And the woman who reached out to me or the woman who's like helping her mother coordinate this is a real estate agent, like for single family homes. Yeah. So she reaches out and she says, I need proof of funds and I need a pre-approval letter. I'm like, ma'am. This is commercial real estate. I'm not buying a single family home, but I'm working with a local credit union who was like, I got this. And in fact, I actually already know this woman personally. So he calls her up and, and handles it. And 
the terms I'm getting are, they're obviously not as strong as a Fannie or Freddie, but they're within a point, which is incredible to think yeah. about. So yes, if those listening in, whether you're buying mobile home parks, smaller mobile home parks or RV parks, definitely call the local credit unions. They can offer some pretty incredible terms, but the downside is they usually have a smaller geographical footprint. So that's cool to hear. So it, it definitely, Heather, what I'm hearing here, there's a lot of that of similarities yes. between the two spaces. But let's kind of dive down into really the pros and cons, because from what I'm hearing so far, pros being you probably will get a higher clientele. You can have multiple, multiple different res- revenue streams. Cap rates are higher. You put a little bit more elbow grease into it, but you can possibly cash flow it a lot better. Negatives Typically being- no. Typically no rent control. Yeah. You're, yeah. you're skipping some of those. Also the regulations from the city aren't as aggressive. They don't hate you. <laughs> you know, yeah. the stigma isn't there. You know, you're missing a few of those things. Yeah. You get people out faster, which is great. Yeah. Yep. What we've painted a really nice picture so far. We have, let's, yeah. let's, let's, let's hit everybody with the IRL, the in real life portion. Yeah. What, what stinks about RV parks? Well, it's not mailbox money, right? You know, it's, there's definitely some work involved there. And like we talked about earlier, I live in South Florida and my properties are in Tennessee. So at this point I manage my managers. So it is actively managing them, but I'm kind of doing that at my leisure, wherever I want to be. Uh, you also, you're dealing with the public, which you do that in uh, the mobile home park space, obviously, but uh, you know, you get complaints like right now, I'm literally yesterday, got the email from my attorneys, this lady suing me over $500. And it's because they made a reservation to stay in a glamping tent and her 82 year old mother did not find the accommodations to her liking. You're like, why do you have an 82 year old in a tent? Like it's a tent. So the kind of BS dealing with the public, which we're already used to in the mobile home park space seems to be a little more irritating. Um, But if you're not on the front lines, you're not dealing with that anyway. You've got your ladies in the office doing most of that. (laughs) <laughs> so in other words, in other words, you start getting bougie, bougie problems. Yeah. Oh, this exactly. wasn't to my liking. Yes. That's, that's funny. Yeah. That's so in other words, you're entering much more into the customer service space, which yes, for sure, my early twenties were spent in that space. And I am very glad I am out of that for the most part, because people complain about anything. Uh, yes. Which when is, I started hanging up on people in the office, I realized I was not the one for that role. <laughs> That's hysterical. So interesting, interesting, interesting. I, about a year or two ago, tried to build a database out for RV parks. And I found that there was a lot to be desired in terms of there's not as many of them. Is that, was that gut feeling pretty spot on or? No, there's a ton of them. It's just, there isn't short of digging through uh, local permitting and things like you would if you were trying to find mobile home parks, going through the good SAM list um, on their website. They do a pretty good job of going through cities and rating parks. So you Mm -hmm. can go through their list and see what they've got. But there isn't that comprehensive list out there like you might find in some other asset classes. Yeah. So long story short, sounds an awful lot like mobile home parks. So I'm assuming too, that you can pretty much just pick up the phone and cold call just like you would in mobile home parks. And and I would assume mailers and all that jazz too, same block and tackle. Exactly. And it's similar to mobile home parks is in its relationship building. Like a lot of times getting to purchase those properties is the relationships that you're building and that funnel you've got going in from different things. Like you said, mailers and brokers and whatever cold calling the relationship building is a big part of it. Circling back to operations themselves, the one thing that really scares me about underwriting an RV park is the vacancy loss. I don't really understand or feel comfortable with estimating how long a unit is going to be vacant. Is there a general rule of thumb you plug in there? Does it depend on the location? How do you kind of think through vacancy loss? Yeah, it it depends. So the nice thing about RV parks is as we're growing in technology, lots of people are using some really great software. So for example, I use a software called Camp Spot and I freaking love it. And you can run all these different types of reports from your software and it's telling you 
very specific data on average stays and um, vacancy for each site specifically or site type or accommodation type. So you get a lot more data per park when you're looking at these properties that are using a software. And a lot of properties are running their properties with software. So that helps you in your, your underwriting process. Let me ask the obvious question right now, because again, this all stems from folks reaching out to me going, gosh, I'm having trouble finding a mobile home park to buy. Yeah, or infilling Our, your mobile home park right now is a big deal. That's a huge deal. So I yeah. found out, I spoke to my local planning zoning department at one of my properties where I have a ton of vacant pads where the infrastructure hadn't been developed out yet. And they said, hey, campers are cool. In fact, permits are like a fraction of the cost. Yeah, so we've, we're, I just green lighted 14 new camper spots to be developed out and I probably will get all of my money back within 12 months. Yeah. It's really exciting. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of it, but let me ask a somewhat obvious question here, because again, this all, the idea for this interview all came about from just the volume of people going, well, should I just go and buy an RV park? I'm struggling to find a mobile home park. Heather. <laughs> You have two deals hit your desk. You can only do one of them. I think you know where I'm going with this. It's an RV or a mobile home park. Which one do you go for if you have to pick one and why? I'm buying the RV park because sky's the limit on my operational changes to add value to that property. Mobile home parks, it takes a long time to make the changes. And it's, it's a flip of a coin on if you're going to get to do that or not. Fair point. I'm a little uncomfortable right now because I'm supposed to be pro mobile home parks, and I just invited someone on saying, "Hey, no, you should do RVs." But and I'm not I love saying it. don't buy mobile home parks. I feel like the mobile home parks stabilize my portfolio a little bit. Yeah. Um, because the RV parks, we haven't talked about it. We've kind of skirted around it, or hair more risky because you know you're dealing with tourism essentially in some of those aspects, or you're not. You're dealing with um, long-term tenants, as long as you don't make the mistake and buy a man camp, um, you've got kind of an endless supply of RVs that'll come in with people living there. But I do feel like the mobile home parks stabilize my portfolio a little bit. Yeah, they're different risk profiles, hence the higher cap rates. Why don't we spend right. a couple minutes on that? Because obviously a longer term RV park will be less risky than a tourist location, which will ebb and flow with. But you're going to bring in a ton more cash. So right. that's kind of the, if we were talking about multifamily, we'd be talking about this cash on cash and how important that is to us. You, the cash on cash on RV parks is like through the roof compared to what you're going to find in, in a long-term versus a short-term RV park or mobile home park. Someone like me, I, I had this episode a while back about cash flow versus appreciation. Gun to my head, I always pick appreciation. Why? Because I subscribe to the Ryan Smith philosophy of wealth isn't taxed, knock on wood, as of this recording. And I would rather have a high net worth than a ton of money, ordinary income coming in. So and I kind of- short-term RV parks, you get both is what we're saying. You get appreciation. Because if you think about yeah. back to the beginning of the story, the mm -hmm. RV park that was $3.2 million. So that was April will be 11 years ago. And that property is now worth 13 million. So when we're talking about appreciation, like um, th that property will gross 2.5 million this year and look at the appreciation. So you're getting both. Wow. So if it's going to gross 2.5 and you're running an average, you said 45 to 55% expense. So you're talking about a little over a million pre-debt. If you even have debt left on it, that's not a bad deal for zero down. Exactly. <laughs> so, so you're, you're not amazing. losing out on appreciation is what I'm telling you. That's amazing. Yeah. Because the big thing for me is I like to go in, fix a mobile home park and then go, oh, well, look, Collier's comes in and does an appraisal or Newport comes in, does an appraisal or whomever comes in and does an appraisal and look how much more it's worth now. Hooray. And I can refinance and, and get some of my, my money back. Uh, but to me, what you're saying here is even though it's more risky, cap rates are higher, you can still come in, really do a lot of wonderful things and still get both the cash flow and the appreciation. Absolutely. Love to hear all of that. <laughs> let's, let's, pivot now before I start getting jealous. You're going to be texting Ian. Let's go buy some <laughs> RV parks. 
I know, I know. We have them hit our desk all the time and we're like, man, I just, it's, to me, it's a, another skill set that it's I know I'm going to have to go. Yeah. It's not. And, you know, we've tried it at several, one of, several of our properties and we have a splash of it, but it's all long-term stuff. I don't yeah. take anyone for less than a month. And really I tell, I turn po- folks away who want to be there for less than two. Yeah. So in other words, they, and, and a lot of folks, and this is mind boggling to me, a lot of folks will actually deck and skirt their RVs and put vinyl siding on them. Yeah. For so a like, story. They're staying and never like, leaving. <laughs> it's not going anywhere. This they is effectively big things over the top of them so that they have roofs and Oh yeah. I mean, extensions. Yeah. It, and it's, and it's exciting to see. It's like, they're, you know, they're not going anywhere. I love it. So, you know, I, I have an RV exposure, but to me, what we learned when we were building out RVs out at one of our properties in Georgia is we learned that neither Ian nor I really care about campers. Like we, we just don't, um, our passion doesn't lie there. Whereas our passion does lie in helping for the affordable housing crisis in this country. So to me, I, I kind of never really gone down that path because I realized that. But the long-term version can be affordable housing. There's a there. huge trend of people who can't afford housing because of the way the, uh, the single family home market has gone with investments. And so these people are buying campers and they're living in their campers. So it still can be that affordable housing route. And I, and I use this analogy often, you know, there's the, you either own an apartment complex or you own a hotel. So, you know, there's still that whole apartment complex model versus you're doing the short-term rental hotel model, which is tourism versus people are living there. So there's still an aspect of it that's affordable housing. They just have a camper instead of a mobile home. I really love to hear that. I yeah, because that's effectively what I'm doing. And it's just a lot easier to get. There's a lot of pros and cons, no matter which way you go. Let me pivot now into speaking of affordable housing into the Section 8 portion. So believe it or not, Heather is one of two people I know that not <laughs> only has Section 8 and mass, but really likes it. I am not a fan of, of Section 8. I've had awful experiences with it. Most folks I know are the same. Heather, what are you doing differently or what am I missing? Or did you just pick an area where Section 8 happens to be really wonderful? I love my Section 8 tenants. So all my Section 8 is in Knoxville, Tennessee and Mm -hmm. in um, Blount County. So I think you Mm -hmm. have some properties out there too. I do. Um, And I bought two mobile home parks that had a ton of park owned homes and I didn't know what to do with them. Yes, we know the whole fix them up, sell them, all those different things. But I already own apartment complexes and duplexes and triplexes and all these different multifamily options that are on Section 8. And my representative with them was like, you know, you can rent mobile homes Section 8 too. I was like, really? I didn't know that. And so the first one was this uh, double wide that between the lot and the home had cost me, I don't know, maybe $30,000. Um, but it's a four bedroom and it rents for $1,200 a month on section eight. So I think what you're doing wrong is you don't realize the amount of money you can get through section eight, because Mm. my, my lot rent might be 350 bucks in that market and I can get $1,200. I already have a maintenance team because of my multifamily. I don't care if they call me randomly for some small mine or something. I freaking love it. Yeah, the Delta is big enough there where you're talking about almost 900 bucks, 850 bucks a month. And when you look at it, you're not going to spend 850 bucks a month fixing Yeah, and things. this is not a new double wide by any means. Mm. My, my experience in Section 8 has never been over 600 bucks a month. And as you know, the market where we're at is 300 to 400s. Yeah. And, and nothing, the one bedrooms right now for section eight in those markets, I'm getting 700 bucks and yeah. I don't have, and I don't have one bedroom trailers. So those are for my apartments. So. Interesting. So it's, it sounds like it's the same argument of why you would keep a park on home to begin with, which is the Delta between what you can get for lot rent versus what you can rent rent is dramatic. Now, do you feel like those residents are a lot rougher. They treat the home a little bit rougher. They have no weird riffraff. I think they're great. And let me tell you why you just talked about, um, having this passion for affordable housing in 
the areas that I'm in, they're on a two-year wait list. These hmm. people have been waiting a long time to get somewhere to live and they do not want to be kicked out of that program. So they're usually really grateful and really good tenants. The only downside is when they leave, they leave everything, which happens anyway in mobile home parks. They leave everything. Like they literally don't look like they took anything they own with them, their wallet, and that's it. So same deal. Um, I have a crew of people that I can call and they'll have everything out by morning and I don't really want to know anything about the people. I just give them the money that they ask for. Um, as long as you've got somebody like that, you're in good shape. Interesting stuff. That is pretty mind blowing to me because I've had the exact opposite experience and most people have. So in other words, it may, if you're just in that area of Blount County, it may be more of a right place, right time type thing. It is. And so check the county's website for what they're paying for section eight. And it's yeah. by the bedroom. They're not deciding, you know, if it's a mobile home or an apartment or a house. Um, they're paying you by the bedroom. So check the zip code on the local website and make your decision based on that. And right. obviously screen your tenants the same way you would, even though they're coming out of section eight. My other friend is actually in South Florida doing South Florida Section 8. So that's another oh, and decent I'm sure area. South Florida. And you think of it this way. The ghetto of Miami versus the ghetto of Knoxville, Tennessee are two very different places. And so, you know, making the decision to do Section 8 in Atlanta versus like a random town in Mississippi are going to be two very different things. So location probably plays a factor in that also. In my opinion, it's a little bit riskier for a lot of reasons too, but your money is coming in basically no matter what. So that really hedges against the the risk. Another big complaint I've had is it limits you in your rent growth, but if you're getting 1200 bucks. And it doesn't, it doesn't limit you. They, they hmm. change those and you give them 90 day notices on rent increases. And in, as long as there's wow. local comps to prove that, I haven't had anything denied on those increases. Interesting stuff. Lots of reasons why people should be reaching out to you, by the way, which we'll get to in, in a minute. But before we do, I want to talk about your brokerage past, because yeah. the interesting thing about you is you started off as an owner, then you went and you got your brokerage license. And Ian ended up doing the same thing for us because we kept coming into these deals and we're like, we're never going to buy this. We don't want it for X, Y, or Z reason, but there's no reason we shouldn't monetize that relationship. Yeah. Hence, get your brokerage license. D can you walk us through your story and why you would recommend getting a broker's license or, or looking the other way? I think there's a couple things you can do with that. So I did brokerage for about four years for RV parks and mobile home parks all over the US and Canada. And it was an awesome experience. I learned a ton. I learned a lot about leveraging debt with the different people that you're exposed to in something like that. And some of the things that I did learn though is as an, you know, an owner of RV parks and mobile home parks, we're hunting for deals all the time. So like you said, you've got those coming across your desk anyway. So you could do one of two things. There are definitely brokers that would make a deal with you to get those leads. And you could do it that way because that's a lot easier than being the broker yourself. Because if you spend all the time being the broker, you don't get to spend the time you need to spend building your portfolio and operating your properties. Because you're, you know, you heard the saying working in your business versus on your business. You're too much time in that brokerage business. So you can either feed them to brokers for a fee. Or you could wholesale them. Like we don't talk a ton about that in our space, but in the single family home and mobile home or in uh, multifamily space, there's a ton of people who wholesale deals. So you as assign them and move on. So it sounds like if you want to be a really good broker, you need to focus your time on you being need to a, be brokerage. a brokerage. Yes. You want to be a really good mobile home park, RV park owner operator. That's you, you can't do two at once well. Right. Would What advice would you have then just going down the wholesaling route or is it still, does it still make sense to get licensed? I, I honestly believe it only makes sense to get licensed if you plan on that being part of your job. Some people need that extra stream of revenue and because they're just starting out and it's a good way to kind of combine both worlds. Um, but if you don't actually plan on being a broker, I don't think that you need to go get your license. I would feed them to a niche broker for a fee because um, they're usually happy to give you a decent fee off of that. And then you can give up the, the legwork from there or host selling those deals. If you have all the contacts yourself on 
who like, for example, y'all have your Facebook group. You could easily get rid of those through wholesaling. You wouldn't have to feed them to somebody else. So I think this answer is going to be pretty self-evident, but of the two, which would you rather do? And it sounds like, duh, I'd rather be an owner than broker <laughs> yeah. because that's what you're doing. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. So I love this speak for this interview for many re reasons, Heather. First and foremost, because I get asked all the time, should I do RV if I can't find mobile home parks? And then another really big question I get asked all the time is, is it worth it to go get my broker's license? Should I wholesale some deals so I have some capital? And yep. from what it sounds like, you were very similar to me when you got started. You did not put a penny into your first deal. Right. Until it was like closing time and you had to write a $20,000 check, <laughs> yeah. right? But yeah. in other words, you got started with nothing, so to speak, because you didn't need anything down. And then you got into brokerage, not the other way yeah. around. I really am glad that you got to share that part of your story because I really encourage people like if you want to go down the broker's route, that's great. There are You could do wonderfully spectacular spectacularly well but the thing is if you want to be an owner operator that's what you need to be focusing on so i yes. love love to hear that some people seem to make the mistake of thinking that it, it, they're related that you need to do both and you don't there, there's no reason to do both heather you have so much wisdom we can't even touch on here and because of that you started a coaching business Tell us more about that. Yeah. So when I got started 11 years ago, I tried Googling, I tried calling people, I tried everything imaginable to figure out how the heck do you run an RV park? And there weren't any great resources out there. And so because of that, I created my own program. So I have a course that if people just want to get some information, it's a pre-recorded course that has about eight hours of content. And then for people who want more than that, I have a mastermind group where we do weekly sessions with industry experts and then uh, private coaching in addition to that. So it's been a really fun group to learn and watch everybody grow. I had a call earlier and uh, they closed on their first two parks and it's super exciting to see them doing that. So you can find all that information on my website at heatherblankenship.com. I also have tons of free information on my social media, which is heatherblankenshipx3 on Instagram and TikTok. For everybody listening in, I'm going to drop all of those links that Heather mentioned there and some in the show notes. So whether you're watching this on YouTube or listening to this on the podcast, look no further than the show notes. It'll all be right there. Heather, super awesome having you here. Thanks for having me, Ryan. It was fun. Yeah. Take care and everybody check out the show notes for those links. Heather would love to help you out.